Carrie Lee Merritt, and welcome to another episode of Meritocracy. Today, I am so thrilled to have Dr. Kevin Cruz on the show. Kevin Cruz is a professor of history at Princeton University. He specializes in the political, social, and urban suburban history of 20th century America, with a particular interest in conflicts over race, rights, and religion, and the making of modern conservatism. A Nashville native and an alumnus of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Kevin earned his MA and PhD from Cornell University. Kevin is the author of White Flight, Atlanta and the Making of Modern Conservatism, which won the 2007 Francis B. Simpkins Award from the Southern Historical Association and a 2007 Best Book Award in Urban Politics from the American Political Science Association. He is also the co-author of Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, and his most recent book, One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America, investigates the making and meaning of American religious nationalism in the mid-20th century. He is currently conducting research for his new book, The Division, John Doerr, The Justice Department, and the Civil Rights Movement. After the division, Kevin will turn his attention to law and order, the politics of crime and culture in New York City. In addition, he has co-edited three essay collections, appeared in countless TV interviews, and has written op-eds for the biggest newspapers in America. You can find out more about Dr. Cruz and his work on his website, kevinmcruz.com. And of course, if you don't already, go ahead and follow him on Twitter, at Kevin M. Cruz. Thanks so much for watching Meritocracy. Hi, I'm Carrie Lee Merritt, and welcome to another episode of Meritocracy. Here with me today is the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Kevin Cruz. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hey, my pleasure. So before we get into all the heavy political stuff, which you know, you're mainly here for, I wanted to ask a few personal questions. So most people really consider you somewhat of an activist because you're so political mm -hmm. on Twitter and even in your op-ed writings and interviews. But what do you consider yourself? Do you consider yourself a political person or do you think you're really just a historian out there telling the truth? I mean, I like to think that I'm just a historian telling the truth, but I, but I think I've, I've certainly become much more outspoken in my politics over the last, uh, uh, well, through this Trump presidency, really. I used to not do these kind of public events. I certainly wasn't on social media, uh, but really in the last uh, few years, I've kind of uh, decided that that old uh, kind of professorial neutrality that we sit back in the back of the room uh, and, and don't speak up um, wasn't helping anyone. And there have been a lot of questions about history, so it feels like the line between history and politics is incredibly blurred and, and needs historians uh, out here doing this, uh, this sort of work to try to, to try to make sense of how the past informs the present. Do you really think that Trump's election and that was what made you really come out politically? Right before the 2016 election really kicked in, what really got me kind of off the bench was the public debate about um, about the Confederate past and, and, and memorials. You'll remember this. There was a lot of discussion in the summer of 2015 about what the, the Confederate monuments represented, what Confederate memorials uh, celebrated uh, that seemed to be uh, a lot wrong. Uh, and, and as... Um, as an historian from the South and an historian of the South, it offended me on both levels. Uh, and I, uh, I started to speak out um, much more uh, about those things uh, that summer. And then that kind of naturally segged into uh, the start of the Republican uh, and Democratic uh, uh, primaries for the 2016 presidential campaigns. What really whetted my appetite for this was the debate over Southern identity, and then it just segged right into the political season. Uh, the utility I found in speaking out on one uh, kind of became amplified with, uh, with the election. Like me, you're from the South, as you just said, mm -hmm. born in Nashville, Went to school in North Carolina. Te technically born in Kansas City. That's where all the all the chief stuff comes from. But, That's but right. lived there okay. from lived there from when I was seven. So yeah, um, uh, by all effects, a, a southerner. So what does your background being a southerner really mean to you? I always start my talks off now, you know, saying I grew up in a racist family in a racist region. I was educated with racist textbooks. What did that mean to you? And, and did that bring you into history? Did that have any part in you becoming a historian? 
the southern atmosphere um uh, southern history is one that is kind of um uh, replete with myths and meanings for the present so what really got me in, into history was i was fascinated by the civil rights movement which you know had unfolded um uh, all around me uh, but i didn't recognize the white people in the civil rights movement stories they were either this small sliver of hardcore segregationists like bull connor or they were these kind of uh, uh, crusading do-gooders like Virginia Durr, uh, and the vast majority of white people that I knew around me growing up simply didn't fit either the, those pictures of kind of outright saints or sinners. And so what had always animated me, and, and really I was thinking about this in, as an undergrad, uh, uh, trying to kind of puzzle this out, of what were the ordinary white people who clearly supported segregation but weren't kind of, you know, the Bull Connor figures, how did the civil rights movement uh, impact them, change their thinking, where did they go? Uh, and so that certainly drew me in, is that I was seeing something in my uh, in my day-to-day -day life uh, that wasn't represented in the, in the history, and I wanted to kind of pull at that thread. So yeah, that absolutely got me involved. So I want to turn to the political now for just a minute and ask you a little bit about your election predictions and your advice to people over the next really week. This is going to air eight days before the election. So drawing on your deep wealth of knowledge of the American political system, what would you advise people to do? What should they be prepared for? Should they prepare for violence, riots, labor strikes? You know, uh, uh, generally I like to joke that, you know, my training as an historian, uh, my professional training is, is in hindsight and I shouldn't make predictions. Uh, but I think we've certainly seen enough um, through this year and echoes of past elections that I think we'd be wise to to be prepared for anything. It could be that there's a Biden blowout on, on election night and none of this comes to pass. Uh, election officials and, and political leaders need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. I, I think what we're gonna see, uh, no matter what, is an election that is drawn out. Uh, this is not gonna be one, and again, I may be wrong. I'd love to be wrong. It's not gonna be one in which um, we have a clear sense of the winner uh, on election night. Uh, the idea that this is gonna be wrapped up uh, by, the, by the morning of November 4th is, is ludicrous, just given the number of mail-in ballots and the delay that'll take uh, to process those and, and make sure we have a full and fair accounting. So I think what the first thing that everyone needs to be aware of is we need to be patient. Um, you're not going to get an answer, I think, one way or the other on election night. Again, I may be wrong. I'd love to be wrong. But beyond that, I think we do need to be prepared for uh, a wide array of attempted uh, and threatened interference uh, in the processes of the election. And whether these are people protesting uh, at polling sites or um, uh, state legislatures um, trying to screw with um, a mail-in ballots, uh, there are going to be certainly legal challenges. There's going to be a lot going on. The one thing we can all do, uh, you know, if, if you're if you're a governor or a secretary of state, I hope you take action. But I'm assuming most of your audience might not be. If you're looking for something you can do, a I think if at all possible, vote in person uh, earlier on election day, so that those numbers are reflected in that first total. Uh, there's a chance that uh, Democrats all move to mail-in voting, and and Trump therefore has a huge seemingly lead on election night before you know, a third of the votes have even been counted. So vote uh, in person if you can. A volunteer to be a poll worker uh, and a poll watcher. I think that's an incredibly important uh, job that is going to really matter in these days. And three, you know, in the meantime, do everything you can to, um, uh, to get people out to vote. Contact your friends and family. Uh, make sure they've got a plan. Make sure they've got a clear sense of when, how, and, and, and where uh, they're going to vote. What would you say to the media along those lines of how to really prepare the American public to wait this out possibly for weeks, if not, hopefully not months? Well, I think the media has a really important role here. And, and I understand the attraction to kind of the horse race coverage of who's up at any given moment. What does this one poll mean? What is this the swing state going? There's a lot the media can and should be doing between now and the election. One, making sure people understand the voting process. Um, I think this is something that local media really should spend some time on. How do you uh, handle a mail-in ballot? How do, you, uh, how do you prepare it? How do you uh, protect it? How do you make sure it doesn't get thrown out? Uh, at the same time, I think what the media can do, and this is local as well as national, is really pound home the obvious fact that this is not going to be decided on election night. And to resist the urge uh, if uh, Trump or Biden comes out on election night and just and, and announces before a, a large percentage of the votes have been processed that clearly they've wrapped it up. 
uh, and any votes that come in after this point are somehow illegitimate. They need to guard against that uh, and to caution uh, the American people. And it looks like polls are showing most Americans do think that there won't be an election night winner, which is which is good. But I think we need to keep a pound of that home because as the longer the election draws on, the, the, obviously the more people are going to want some kind of closure. They're going to want this thing to be over. Uh, and the campaigns will certainly be fueling that pressure. So anything I think we can all do to sort of pump the brakes and make sure that people recognize this is gonna take some time uh, is ultimately gonna be good. So how do you personally deal with just all of the heaviness and the stress and the constant, you know, five news cycles a minute that we're in? How do you decompress? I have two roots uh, that, that work for me. Um, I don't do these, I don't do these at the same time. Uh, uh, drinking bourbon always helps at night and uh, I go for runs. Uh, and again, don't combine them, but either one on their own uh, works well. A lot of what I do is actually, um, I may be fueling other people's anxiety, but, but Twitter actually uh, helps me. I used to just yell at the TV, uh, and now I can tweet something out, and, and I think you can feel what used to be that old moment of, of, what did I just, what was that? Did the president really just say that? And am I alone in hearing that and, and recognizing that? There's now, you've got a community out there that can say, no, that, that was in fact something insane or ludicrous and, and, and here's why. So that I think helps uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm sure we're only effectively uh, uh, passing along the anxiety to other people who then are exposed to this stuff. But I think those three things in, in combination, uh, again, not all at the same time, uh, help keep me somewhat sane. The book you're currently working on now is about John Doerr and the Justice Department during the Civil Rights Movement. What do you think is going on with the Justice Department today under Trump and the mess that Bill Barr has made of it? It's really remarkable. I mean, it is the most politicized we've seen the DOJ in 100 years, uh, and it is really sad. Um, and one thing that has really struck me and working on this project on John Doerr and the men and women in the DOJ Civil Rights Division who worked alongside him in the early 60s, is to really remember that uh, our institutions matter, but more importantly, the people who staff those institutions matter. The civil rights movement doesn't do right, doesn't bring justice on its own. It has to be propelled that way by the actions of individuals. And I think what we've seen in the past uh, four years is a stunning devolution of what's gone on in the DOJ uh, from its old purpose of actually providing impartial justice uh, for the American people to its new role where it seems to be basically uh, an arm of the Trump campaign. What Barr has done uh, in, in the past few weeks uh, here in late September has really been uh, staggering uh, and it would have been unthinkable for an, an attorney general um, of either party to have done this much that was nakedly political, nakedly in service of uh, a president's reelection effort. Um, I mean, this is where, I mean, you know, John Mitchell was awful, but he had resigned the attorney general position to run uh, the president's, uh, Nixon's reelection campaign, right? Um, and what we see here is, is Barr is effectively doing that from inside uh, the DOJ, which is just uh, grossly irresponsible. What do you think the cleanup is going to look like for that? What are we going to have to do to really get the department back to what it was pre-Trump? It's going to take a huge effort. Um, it's going to take, uh, I think, a um, an attorney general who's willing to roll up his or her sleeves and really uh, do the work of restoring the old norms uh, to the DOJ of, of removing um, uh, the politicization. And it can't be, uh, there'll be other ways in which I think Democrats respond in kind to the escalations made by Trump and the Republicans. DOJ in a lot of ways really does have to get back to its basic rule. It can't become a democratic political machine the way in which Barr has made it a Republican one. It really does need to be that they are the, the, the lawyers for the American people. Uh, that's going to undo a lot of what Trump did, but it can't, it can't roll too far in the other direction. As for what happens with these individuals, um, I mean, that's going to be ultimately up to, uh, to Congress, who I'm sure will have hearings on a lot of the, the things we're seeing now, which are clearly uh, beyond the pale. I think you'll see uh, state bar associations probably take a look at a couple of people's uh, legal licenses uh, as a result of what's been going on here. But, but it's going to take a lot of work to undo what has been done. You know, the, our institutions 
um, build up through accretions of power of processes uh, uh, over time. And a lot of that has been um, hacked away. Um, a lot of the things that have been norms and, and stability and a lot of institutional memory and, and, and career civil servants who have um, been kind of forced out in DOJ and across the federal government. So it's going to take a while to build that back, to, to build up what is now a hollowed out foreign service, to build up health and human services, uh, to, to build up um, uh, people at the EPA who'd been there from one administration to the next. Uh, and finally gave up under this one. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work to recruit, uh, not just experienced people back into government, but a new generation and that's willing to actually do the hard work. Given all of your research on Nixon, along those same lines, what do you see as the path to justice here? Do you think that Trump and people in his administration should be charged with crimes? Do you think that there should be some kind of justice? As I've argued in the past, I think... Um, you know, a lot of people look back on Ford's pardon of Nixon as, as a good thing, as, you know, turning the page on Watergate, in Ford's words, our long national nightmare is now over. Uh, but the problem with that is that the wrongdoers um, got away. Um, as set an example for future ones. We saw this with Iran-Contra. Uh, there has to be some kind of accountability. And I think the biggest mistake that uh, the Obama administration made when they came in, and again, the world was on fire at the time, not as bad as it is now, but there was a lot they had to deal with, but they made it very clear that they were going to um, turn the page, as they constantly said. They weren't going to prosecute uh, Bush officials for, um, uh, for torture. They weren't going to uh, take a, a heavy hand against Wall Street for the financial meltdown. And they were just going to move on and deal with, with things. Well, the, you can't move on without a full reckoning of the past, without accountability. And that has to happen. It, it'll be spun this way by, by Trump's supporters. But it won't be a kind of a, a, a vindictive a reprisal, uh, but rather true accountability and true justice. Um, and so people who broke laws uh, will need to be held accountable. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have uh, congressional hearings and, and all sorts of, of court cases over those. Uh, there needs to be a full uh, accounting, certainly, of what this administration did on the coronavirus. We will still be dealing with that if Biden wins and is sworn in in, in January of 2021. We'll still be dealing with that. We need to learn what was done over the past year, what went wrong, what went right, uh, and how to how to build on that. Uh, so that's that's clearly got to happen. Uh, the the variety of you know, uh, penny any graft and fraud and, and corruption, uh, that'll be dealt with too. But there are some big pressing issues that are going to have to be addressed right off the bat. So we're looking at years and years and years of this just playing out, unfortunately. So now for a minute, let's just assume that somehow either Biden wins or Trump is no longer in office. And obviously, uh, we are going to face as we just discussed, years and years of cleanup, years and years of trying to restore faith in America internationally, and probably just years and years of getting people back on track economically after this pandemic. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what two or three main issues do we really, really need to focus on in the first 100 days of the next presidency? Oh, if I had to pick three, I would say um, the first one has to be restoring uh, democratic norms. Uh, and so I think, uh, and it all begins with the vote. So I think a Voting Rights Act restoration um, would be the top priority. And I'm encouraged that I think uh, congressional Democrats see that as their top priority too. Because everything really do, will fall out of that. If, if, if you can get um, a voting rights restored, if you can get people's faith back in the electoral process and they, they turn out and you have support for these later reforms, it all begins there. Reforming democracy is going to be the key one. I think reforming the government needs to happen too. Uh, whatever happens with the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Trump will still appointed a, a huge slew of, uh, uh, of appointees to the federal judiciary, um, and they'll still be there. Um, Congress can, of course, expand the size and the scope of, of any federal courts, and if Democrats have uh, both chambers, I think they could, they could do something there. Uh, and I think an, an expansion of the court might be in the works if Republicans ram through uh, this, uh, this, this new nominee as it looks like they will. We haven't had an expansion of the House of Representatives, which used to happen every 10 years uh, and 100 years. And the number 435 isn't frozen in, in stone. It's not written in the Constitution. Uh, and so the average district is much bigger than it ever used to be. And as a result, I think our understanding of representative democracy is really um, worn thin. 
Uh, and so I think that would be something that they could and should do. Uh, statehood for DC and Puerto Rico, that's another thing that I think absolutely should be on the table. These are uh, American citizens who simply don't have uh, representation in the Senate, uh, don't have uh, uh, the kind of the, the full citizenship that, uh, that they should deserve uh, if they so want. Protect voting rights, uh, reform the government. And I think the other one they've got to do early on, both in terms of, of uh, well, maybe give me four. I'll put the COVID thing in there too. The fourth one, though, has got to be climate change. Uh, they've got to come back and do something on this. I mean, uh, we feel like we're living in the the early stages of a uh, of you know one of those those global disaster films. Uh, I mean, the wildfires in the West, the new surge in hurricanes. Uh, we had an earthquake in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, last week. That doesn't normally happen. Uh, so there's a lot going on uh, that is kind of uh, 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 crazy and skewed. And I'm not saying the earthquake is something that that, that uh, is tied to climate change. I'm not a scientist. But there's a lot that I think we can and should do. And, and we're kind of running out of time on this. And it's clearly accelerating and getting worse. So I think um, we need to, to get back to a commitment on, on those issues as well. Do you foresee there ever being any kind of change to the Electoral College in the, in the next decade or two? I mean, it would take a huge process to undo it. I do think the energy is there. I think about, I saw a poll, something like 60, 65% of Americans would want to do away with it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily translate to change actually happening. Uh, but I think it, it's a system that never worked as it was supposed to and has in the last few years, uh, last few decades, um, clearly subverted the the will of the people on in terms of the popular vote. I mean, it's really kind of remarkable. Were that ever to happen again, um, you know, were we to see somebody lose the popular vote by six million, seven million, eight million, and win through the electoral college? I think you would see a huge uh, movement. I think it would break uh, our our system. And so uh, we've come close to pushing back. There was a movement movement in the late se- late sixties to undo the electoral college after. George Wallace's third party win, uh, third party run in 1968, uh, almost through the election to the House. There's a real sense of, well, we should probably get rid of this thing. And it almost happened. It could, it could happen again. Um, it would take a long process. Uh, there are also there are ways around it. The national popular vote contract, um, if enough states log on to this thing where they say that we're going to award our electoral college votes to whoever wins the national popular vote, it basically is an end run around the EC. That, I think, would be more easy. Uh, but that's a hard process. Again, it's going to happen state by state. It could happen. Uh, I don't think it's likely to happen just yet, but uh, I think we're moving more and more in that direction. Along those same lines, the very aristocratic nature of the Senate has probably never been more clear than it is now. Do you support there being some kind of reorganization of how we elect senators or how they're apportioned? Mm-hmm. Do you have any ideas on on how to make that a more equitable system? I'm not a fan of term limits in general. I feel like they're an artificial barrier against um, expertise, and they actually only, I think, increase the dependence that legislators have on lobbyists um, because they don't have the, uh, their own institutional memory. That said, we've got a system in which we've got um, people who would have long ago retired in any other field uh, who are who are still there, and that can be problematic in terms of, of, you know, how out of touch are they with a technology? You remember Senator Ted Stevens, I think, was what called the inter- internet a series of tubes or something like that, or, or to, to listen to Charles, Charles Grassley, you know, try to talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, a Twitter or something. It's, it's, it's a little cringy. So I, I do think we need to have a, a trend towards, uh, towards, towards younger uh, uh, representation in both uh, of the Senate and the, and the House. But I'm, I'm not sure there's an easy way around that. Uh, as long as voters keep electing uh, these folks, I think that uh, that then uh, becomes a self-replicating cycle. I think one of the things we can do is to fight gerrymandering wherever we can so that both Democrats and Republicans, this is only applied to the House, of course, but they don't have these kind of lifetime seats where they're constantly, well, once you're in, you're kind of there. Uh, and you've got these congressmen and women who are there for you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, I think if you make them more competitive, um, they'll have to stay sharp or they'll be replaced. Now that the people have gotten an amazing, wonderful education for free from you on the show, since you're so graciously donating your time, I wanted you to highlight certain causes that you really care about. If there's a charity that you would like people to check out, either read about, donate their time, their, their money. 
in general, I think one of the, the biggest issues facing the country is is voting rights to, to donate to places like the ACLU, uh, the Brennan Center, which uh, which focuses on, on voting rights issues, I think would be uh, would be a great, a great way to, to help shore that up. If you could offer one piece of advice to Americans as to how to try to heal from our past, how to come together, how to move forward from the last four or five years of, of such division and strife, what would that be? Uh, I think it would be to, whenever possible, to try to listen and understand the people with whom you disagree. And I mean, listen to them directly. I think so much of our current state is that, and there are horrible people on both sides. Uh, I, not, well, I said both sides. There are horrible people, on, I'm not gonna say there are equal measures, but they're out there, I get that. But I think too often Americans now in our um, hyper slice and diced media climate are only hearing from people with whom they agree and they only hear about the people they disagree with filtered through those people, right? So if you're a, a hardcore conservative and all you watch is Fox News and your only exposure to what liberals and the left are saying comes channeled through Tucker Carlson, you're not understanding what liberals and the left really are saying, right? And I think the same thing is actually true uh, for people on the left. You know, don't just listen to what uh, you know, what sound bites run on, say, uh, on MSNBC or whatever, you know, a, a liberal you follow or leftist you follow on, on social media, take time out and, and read National Review, read the Weekly Standard, well, not Weekly Standard anymore, but listen to, to voices on the right, unfiltered, disagree with them, take down the argument, absolutely, but he, actually hear what they're saying rather than the sound clip that is pulled, because I think we've been primed through kind of an outrage culture to only hear the very worst of, uh, of the other side. It's what they used to call on blogs nut picking, where you find the one craziest comment uh, in the replies and you blow that up and that's representative of, of all the rest. Really take time to, uh, to, to listen, because I think ultimately there is still a lot that Americans have in common, even though our politics and our media, certainly under this president, both of them have been hyper-partisan, hyper-polarized, uh, and have played up all the differences and ignored uh, the commonalities. I think they're still there. I may be naive, but I, but I think they're still there. That's that's great advice. I'm gonna ask you a couple of little bonus questions. Sure. We have a few minutes left, if that's okay. Given the field of history just being decimated by the crisis in, in the universities and the gutting of, of departments and losses of lines of tenure. Where do you see the field going? Do you have any idea of how to keep the field going, to keep the field diverse, to keep it alive, essentially? Uh, I think more and more universities have to step up and, and have to recognize the role, that they're not passive participants um, buffeted by some free market that is out of their control. Uh, and I think they need to put their resources into their hires um, to move away from the trend towards adjuncting, to move away from uh, uh, taking advantage of a, of a glutted labor market on the academic side and hire more people um, on tenure track, protect people who are at uh, lower level positions. I think also, I think we need to do a better job of training our graduate students. They're not there just to replicate us, right? I'm not growing clones to who are going to one day take over um, my job at, at, at Princeton. One of them hopefully will, <laughs> but uh, I realize that there's a lot more out there. And so I think uh, historians need to stop thinking about public history and other jobs outside of academia as alt-ac, but rather as just as viable, just as important, just as vital uh, a, a career as, uh, as the, the people who are going into a university and teaching undergrads and grad students, right? Uh, and that uh, there's a certain level of, of expertise, of skills, of knowledge that historians have that I think uh, is this maybe the silver lining of the last four years. I've never felt as needed or as wanted as I have before. Um, I think there's a real craving for, uh, for an accurate understanding and presentation of history. So there's certainly a demand for historians. Uh, I just think the, the universities and history departments need to make sure that, they're, uh, that they know what they have and are making sure that they are treating these people with the value and respect that they deserve. Do you have any ideas as to how to make 
that happened at smaller schools and state funded schools, especially I'm thinking throughout the South where, you know, our, our universities have been gutted. So they're, they're really, yeah. there isn't that money there. Again, I come from Princeton where they've, they've got the, you know, I don't have the exact details on the endowment, but they, I'm sure they've got the money to, to, to make some of this happen at smaller schools that are, that are scrapped for, for cash. I think part of the process has to happen with, with state legislatures. Um, stepping up and refunding public education. I'm a graduate of the University of North Carolina, and um, this is back in the early 90s where you could go there in state for like $500 a semester. I mean, it, it, within my own lifetime, I'm not that old, uh, that this model of an affordable public education was out there and they had a top rate faculty. And, and so, the, cause, so the states would put money into these things. Uh, if the states don't do that. The federal government, I think, um, if we get a new administration, certainly a new DOE uh, can step in and do some things here, but I think would be important, um, both in terms of funding uh, these colleges, uh, hopefully giving them the, the ability to, uh, to bring in um, faculty to, to take care of these needs but also through federal programs. I mean, look at the, the New Deal era. Um, the Federal Writers Project um, uh, kept a lot of people alive and well, uh, uh, famous people, um, uh, Arthur Miller, uh, you know, uh, Richard Wright. Uh, there were a lot of big novelists of the of the, the era who were basically kept solvent and able to stay as writers because of the intervention of the federal government. We can do that with history too. Um, uh, we can do that with, uh, with, with subjects outside of, of, of English uh, and employ historians at the local level to, uh, to keep these stories alive, to, to do public events. Um, so there are a number of ways in which I think we can find the resources to this thing that everybody seems to agree is valuable. You know, the president talks about how important history is. I hear people talk about it all the time. They need to realize that you need historians to actually have the, the history uh, uh, transmitted, uh, that, that they go together. Uh, it's not simply that you can pull the, the raw document out and, and, and read the Declaration of Independence and job done. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, and we need to value the people who have devoted their life to that and, and treat what they do as valuable because we keep saying we value it. I love that. And to go along with that, you are now approaching half a million followers. And I think part of the reason that you're so popular on Twitter is because you're obviously very passionate about whether it's history, politics, whatever you're tweeting about at the time. What was it that originally you know, brought that passion to you? What really stuck out to you? What got me passionate about history? Just the fact that it explained so much about the world around me. That there were so many things I didn't, that, that, that seemed important, but I didn't understand the backstory, right? Um, and so to understand, uh, again, where the civil rights movement had come from, where the Southern politics, um, you know, if you look at, at any of my books, they all begin with me being puzzled by something in my current life. So white flight was where all the white people in the civil rights story I keep hearing. One Nation Under God was uh, in the middle of the, the second Bush presidency where this religious nationalism is overwhelming. Where did this come from? Um, fault lines, you know, we're so polarized now. How do we get here? Uh, and so it's that curiosity about the, the present, which ultimately keeps throwing me back into the past. When we do research, it's it's the best thing in the world. It's it's this job is equal parts detective and storyteller, um, and they're both fantastic and honestly fun roles. Uh, and then to have that wrapped up with a sense of the, that the story you're telling, that the truth you're uncovering, is vitally important not just to your understanding of the world, but hopefully other people's, uh, is really an incredible feeling. And so that gets me excited uh, about this job um, uh, each and every day. Dr. Kevin Cruz, we are so, so happy to have had you on the show. Great education, great discussion. Please go ahead and hit subscribe to the YouTube station or your podcast station. We will talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.